between the 6th and the 10th of August 1986, a mountaineering tragedy known as the 1986 K2 disaster took place. By the time the entire climbing season had finished, it would prove to be one of the deadliest periods ever on an 8,000 meter peak. Casualties ranged from the unlucky to the foolhardy, and wild storms cloaked the series of events on the mountain in mystery. K2 is located in the Pakistani part of the Karakoram Range. It is the world's second highest peak, but much more technical and dangerous than Mount Everest. Nine separate expeditions had been granted permission by the Pakistani government to scale the mountain that year, and base camp was awash with big-name climbers. Well-prepared high-quality teams from Britain, Poland, Austria, the US, France, Italy and South Korea attempted a variety of routes, none of which were anything less than treacherous. The first tragedy took place on the 21st of June. The American team, one of many hoping to be the first to summit via the technically demanding and as yet unclimbed southwest pillar route, known as the Magic Line, were caught in an avalanche. Team leader John Smollick and Alan Pennington were killed. Smollick's body has never been recovered. The American team were in no mood to continue and headed for home. Two days later, Polish climber Wanda Rutkiewicz became the first woman to summit K2, followed 30 minutes later by French woman Lillian Berard with her husband Maurice. The six team members in their group had summited late in the day, and the darkness and poor weather forced them to make an emergency bivouac overnight, not far from the summit. All survived that night, but the Berards disappeared in grim weather during the next day's descent. On the 10th of July, Polish team member Tadeusz Piotrowski was killed in a fall after summiting. On the 16th, Italian Renato Casarato fell into a crevasse. He was rescued, but died soon afterwards from his injuries. Another Pole, Wojciech Wrotz, fell to his death from the end of a fixed rope after summiting on the 3rd of August. The next day, a local high-altitude porter, Muhammad Ali, was killed by falling rocks on the Abruzzi Spur route. There were a litany of other incidents, near misses, brushes with death and injuries, yet teams still carried on as if oblivious to what seemed like a season filled with bad karma. By early August, attrition had led many of the remaining climbers to reformulate teams. The British team was down to team leader Alan Rouse and cameraman Jim Curran, who had headed back to base camp. Rouse partnered with Austrians Alfred Imitzer, Hannes Wieser, Willy Barr and Kurt Deenberger, Polish woman Dobroslava Wolf and Britain Julie Tullis. The new team made it to Camp 4, the last staging post before the summit, but for unknown reasons, decided to wait a day until making a summit push. It was a fateful decision. Rouse and Wolf made for the summit on the 4th of August. Wolf dropped back while Rouse continued. He was caught and passed by Barr and Imitzer, and all three summited around 4 p.m., Rouse becoming the first Briton to do so. On the way down, they encountered Deanberger and Tullis, who continued ascending despite efforts to persuade them that it was now too dangerous to continue. They summited around 7 p.m., but were forced to bivouac in the open as the weather closed in. Somehow, all the climbers made it back to Camp 4, but instead of the weather improving, it worsened considerably, and they were trapped at 8,000 metres. Out of food and fuel to melt snow, they got none of the required six litres of water per day needed to stave off the effects of extreme altitude. Tullus died overnight on the 6th to the 7th of high altitude pulmonary edema. The other climbers remained trapped for another three days, but by the 10th of August, 
they realized they had to make a move or die. Rouse was left behind in Camp 4 as he was barely conscious and suffering from altitude sickness. There was stern criticism of this after the disaster, particularly directed at Deemberger, but Rouse's remaining teammate, Curran, defended him and fellow Austrian Willy Barr. Although they were in the best shape of the remaining team members, Curran asserted that there was absolutely no way they could have got Rouse off the mountain in that condition. Alone in a tent at base camp, recording events for a documentary, Curran was well aware of the dire situation above and had all but given up hope of anyone surviving. As they left Camp 4, Emitzer and Wieser collapsed almost immediately and could not be revived. Wolf was on the brink of death as well and disappeared sometime during the descent. Her body was found a year later by a Japanese team, frozen in a standing position to a fixed rope. Deemberger and Barr reached Camp 3, but found it blown away by the storm. In a feat of superhuman endurance, they ploughed ahead to the relative safety of Camp 2, arriving late on the 10th of August. Barr continued on to base camp under his own steam, but Deemberger had to be helped down by Curran and two Polish climbers. Both would later lose multiple toes and fingers to frostbite. It is incomprehensible to non-climbers that such a disaster could be allowed to happen in a season that seemed cursed from the start. No amount of deaths or injuries seemed to discourage them from the goal of reaching the summit, and it was as though they were quite willing to pay the ultimate price to stand atop K2. Perhaps a combination of recklessness, ego, ambition and summit fever took hold when many others had decided that continuing was folly and headed for home. In the aftermath of the 1986 K2 disaster, the wise words of legendary climber Ed Veesters never rang more true. Climbing is a round trip, getting to the top is optional, but getting back down is mandatory. <laughs>